Hey, before I kick off the podcast, I just want to shout out Nextdoor Clothing. Nextdoor, uh, a clothing brand based out of Bondi in Sydney. They're making really nice jeans and shirts and hats. So go and check out their full range at nextdoorsydney.com. They're also artists, so you can go and check out a range of art. They put on rad parties, and I love what they're doing. So nextdoorsydney.com for the full range. Hey, it's Shan here. This week I speak with Ian Larios. Ian is a dietitian, but he's just so much more than just a dietitian and chef. He is the dietitian and nutritionist to literally the best UFC fighters in the world. So he's had a huge uh, six months. He was in the fight camp for light heavyweight champion Jamal Hill in which Jamal won, and then straight after that, he's on the plane back to his home in Bali when he gets a message from the management team of Yair Rodriguez, who is actually becoming one of my most favorite fighters, and uh, they then wanted him in their fight camp, and he has a really important role for these fighters. He's uh, responsible for helping them make their weight division. So the weight cutting process is very difficult for fighters. And traditionally, it's been something that has been done under very aggressive circumstances where, you know, fighters will be wearing sweatsuits, hot baths, saunas, and just basically dehydrating themselves to the point of complete obliteration just to make weight. And then they get this small period of time before the fight to get the water and the fluids back in them. And it's it's a dangerous process. And in, uh, he actually in this episode advocates for more responsible weight cutting in the sport and he's trying to change the culture and make it so it's done safely. He talks about how when fighters are expected to lose so much weight so quickly and dehydrate themselves, they become less responsive and effectively opening themselves up to more danger in the fight. So we talk a little bit about that. We also talk just about his heritage and where he grew up and and his childhood and his life, you know, and what led him to this point in his life. I mean, some might say he's got the most epic lifestyle in the world. UFC fighters call him up. He goes and lives with them for their fight camp. Sometimes it's, you know, four to six weeks. And he's more than just their chef and dietitian and nutritionist. He trains with them, you know, he sleeps at their houses, lives at their houses, making them breakfast, fresh food every day. He's monitoring their calorie intake and their calorie burning and um, just refining and matching that constantly. So super interesting. And um, I love talking to him. He's a really nice guy. I met him briefly, I think last year or the year before uh, in Bali at the Indo Soul shop in Changu. I just recorded an episode with Sam and Gary Bench and Gibb from Sungai Watch and he was around, uh, introduced by uh, mutual friend Kai Paul, co-founder of Indosol Footwear, so go and get yourself a pair of shoes and yeah, we catch up, live from Bali, a few tech issues but I think we got over it in the end, you know that Bali internet just wreaks havoc everywhere every time I do one of these things so it's a good episode, you'll enjoy it. Um, go and check out the Buzzsprout uh, subscriptions and you can subscribe to this podcast and pay what you feel to um, you know keep the podcast going and all that sort of stuff. Actually, you know, I'm going to keep going anyway, but, you know, support me. I'd be stoked. Love you heaps. And uh, this is for the kids as always. You Terrible happy talks. Terrible happy talks. I mean, it's been a heck. It's it's been a hectic two months. It's been a hectic two months. Um, so like coming back to Bali, I always kind of everything slows down a little bit. I can take some time off, kind of take a sigh of relief, and hang out with my dog, um, and really kind of just, I guess, try to wrap my head around everything. Um, Cause yeah, it's been it's been a whirlwind. Um, 
it's been two and a half months, really. I mean, I flew out on Christmas Day to, to Michigan to go to Jamal Hill, and then, you know, I got back last week. So it's been, it's been crazy. To say the least, it's been crazy. <laughs> yeah, so there's an interesting theme with the two fight camps you've been in recently. Both of those fighters are now champions. So Jamal Hill is the light heavyweight champion. You were in his fight camp. Yeah, yeah, Rodriguez, interim featherweight champion. You know, what's going on, man? What? Why do you think you've, you know, had a part in those uh, championship, you know, victories? You know, I play a, a very small role in you I know the big picture, that. and yeah. <laughs> a guy like a guy like Jamal. You know, I don't got to go in there and fight for him. I'm just a small piece of the puzzle. And, I mean, I'm coming on 10 years of doing this, so I do feel like I'm finally gaining some momentum and, and, and people are starting to realize that, you know, I'm, I'm kind of the guy to work with. You know, there's a lot of great people that, that are in the sport, um, but I do feel like momentum is on my side, just coming off that title win with Jamal Hill. Um, and him, obviously, giving me lots of love and lots of credit. Um, and then transitioning straight into into Yair's camp which was awesome because it was in Bali we finished the camp in Bali so it was the first time I ever got to you know be home sleep in my own bed and it really made me realize that you know high level camps can be you know can be done in Bali and uh that also kind of put a light bulb off in my head I was like well hopefully I can I can do a bunch of these in the future because I'm not trying to travel you know six seven months out of the year but I, if I could if I could convince guys to come finish their camp in Bali, it's a win-win. Yeah, it's it's. I mean, it's super inspiring, and I, I do want to go into your backstory. But for those that are unaware, can you please explain your actual role in these fight camps? Uh, we know you're a, you're a chef, dietitian. So can you break it down on a practical level what you're doing exactly in those fight camps? Yeah. So basically, I'm coming in to fight camp to handle all weight management um, and cook for the guys as well. So my background is in is in. Um, sorry, my dog's going crazy. She runs this house. I got yes. to get control of her. <laughs> yes, dude. But um, so my role is to handle weight management. Um, so more so for guys who you know in MMA, a lot of guys cut weight. Um, guys like Jamal Hill, he's a bigger, he's a bigger light heavyweight, but he didn't cut a tremendous amount of weight. So more so, his his camp was focused on just performance nutrition. Um, so he calls me in. Um, I watch him train, kind of figure out how much, how many calories he's burning, um, how hard he's training, um, and I kind of dial everything in for him. So he doesn't have to think about anything in terms of in terms of nutrition supplementation. I handle all that. So he can really just focus on the, the task at hand, which is, you know, fighting for a world title in enemy territory in Brazil. And I handle all aspects, hydration, nutrition, everything that goes on in, with that. I didn't know that. I didn't know you were doing the hydration aspect. There's a real science to what you do. Are you actually monitoring the calories burned and each, tra- each training session and then matching the calorie input required? Yeah, so we ha- I have a general idea of how many calories they're burning. Um, we-, we could strap heart rate monitors on them and stuff, and have like a you know a rough estimate of how many calories they're burning. Um, but the true test to see how many calories they're burning, obviously, a lot of these guys have to be in a calorie deficit. Um, so it's pretty much maximizing the calories they are getting um, in terms of you know obviously he's wrestling a lot, he's training a lot, he's moving a lot. A lot of the times he was completely under eating, so he'd lose weight. You know, so he thought he'd be doing doing good on paper, um, but in terms of like recovery and performing in the gym, you know, he wouldn't feel great. You know, by Tuesday he was drained down and and felt like he wasn't recovering. And so this camp, we really got to dial everything in. You know, he was eating every three to four hours, eating big meals. He he thought he was going to be gaining weight, and so at first he was like, "Are you sure I could be eating this?" I'm like, "Bro, I got you. <laughs> like, trust me." And and then after the first day, he gave me a big hug and was like, I'm going to do everything you tell me to do. Just tell me to do it, I'll do it. And I was like, all right, let's do it. So it made my life easier because he trusted the process. And that's the biggest thing, you know. Changing something for such a big fight, 
I understand like the mental aspect of that. Like I've done everything, you know, and it's gotten me here. So like, why change it? So me coming in, some random dude that lives in Bali, flying across the world to cook for him and handling this for him. You know, it's, he he was a little bit caught off guard at first, but I f- I do feel like with good food, you could break down those walls and uh, you know be <laughs> we were friends almost immediately. So luckily, I could cook a little bit too. Dude, I bawled my eyes out when he won that title. I did. I was just crying my eyes out. Bro, it was a big win, and he he comes from nothing, man. He you know he he's one of those kids that you know if he didn't find if he didn't find MMA, you know he, he could have gone down lots of different paths. But super talented, hard worker, and uh, you know, and he came out of a super small gym in Grand Rapids, Michigan. You know he. It, you just you don't see that anymore. A lot of these guys come out from you know these these big name gyms with multiple world champions, but you know he he gets to be from a small gym that you know the people that train at that gym got to see him train for a world title, got to see him win a world title, and those are just blue collar workers that you know you know everyday people that get to see a world champion you know be born and get to see the work that goes into that, and so everyone played a small role in in that in that win. So getting to see. You know, the pride that all those people had for Jamal and, you know, the support he had when we left. It was, it was incredible. He's, he's a special dude, and the fact that he got to do it out of a, you know, a small little gym in, you know, a random town in Michigan is, is special. And it goes to show you that, you know, talent can be found anywhere, and you, you surround yourself with the right people, you know, that you could shock the world. <laughs> Hell yeah, dude. Hell yeah. Are you selective with who you choose to work with? I'm trying to be more selective. You know, I, I, <laughs> I was just telling one of my friends, I, I, started, I need to start setting boundaries for myself just in terms of, you know, for the longest time, this is everything I wanted to do, and it's the only thing I saw myself doing. Um, I'm 29 years old now, and, you know, I'm trying to have a balance between, uh, you know, work and traveling all over the world. And, and so I, got, I need to start being more selective, but at first I take every opportunity I had, whether it was going to Dagestan, you know, in the middle of, you know, in the middle of winter and, and going to enemy territory there or going to Brazil or anywhere. Any opportunity I got to do what I love, I do. Um, but now I definitely need to start, you know, pulling back a little bit and investing in, you know, what is what the bigger picture is. And, you know, my goal, my goal this year, and I'm, I've been pretty open, I'm going to start being pretty open about it is to be trainer of the year. Um, and I do feel like I'm making, you know, steps towards that with two world titles, you know, in the first couple months of the year. Um, I do feel like I can, I can rake in that uh, MMA awards trainer of the year uh, this year. So that's my goal. So I, I do have to just continue to keep on uh, working as much as possible with, you know, high level guys. But I mean, guys like Jamal, guys like Yair, you know, they're going to stay busy this year. So they'll keep me busy. Yeah, I'm sure they're on board with you now, no, no doubt. And I know those, those, those guys will both have numerous fights this year, which is super exciting. And the prospect of Yair fighting Rodriguez is... I mean, Yair fighting Volkanovski is super exciting. Crazy fight. Super, <laughs> super, super exciting. Super fight. Yeah. yeah. Um, I guess you were saying how you've, you've refined this process. Would you say you're getting a sense now for what these athletes need not just in regards to the, the fuel intake that they're getting, but also as emotional support, do you find that you fall into that role? Big time. I mean, I spend more time with them than any other, any other coach. You know, other coaches get to go home. You know, after a hard session, let's say he has a hard sparring session, is upset, you know, I drive home with him. I cook him dinner, and we, you know, we talk about everything. So it's one of those things that I'm super emotionally invested in, obviously, the outcome for them you know I'm never thinking about how it's gonna you know look up for my career I I just directly see the impact of like how how these wins and losses you know affect them but in terms of being emotional support I'm I'm attached to their hip for you know three four weeks so we're emotional support for each other but more so obviously I'm on the clock so I'm (laughs) I'm catering to them um, so in the ups and downs of all of it, you know, spending pretty much 24 hours a day with someone, you know, it's fighting these huge fights. You really get to see truly who they are, you know, who they are when there's no camera around and, and being around and, and supporting that is, you know, something that I, I think makes me different because, you know, be, being able to, 
you know, jump into a guy, you know, into a camp with a guy you've never met and, and be comfortable doing that is, is completely, you know, completely different than, than any other job that I know people have. So it's something special. And I, I, I do feel like towards the end of camp, you know, I, <laughs> when I leave, I do get a lot of messages from the guys like, oh, what do I do now? Like, <laughs> what am I supposed to do for breakfast? <laughs> So are you but, writing? Are yeah. you writing a, a meal like a weekly meal plan, and then just tweaking it as as training's going, or are you working on a day by day basis? Going, okay, look, he's had a heavy cardio session today. We're going to increase hydration. Is that what you're doing constantly? So it's a, it's constant constant change. If their training changes, you know, it's it's so it's it's definitely an on the fly thing. So I go to all their training sessions. A lot of times I train with the guys. So I have a general idea of how hard they're pushing. I see, you know, days where we have to pull back and I'll talk to the coaches and be like, Hey, like he only got five hours of sleep. Um, this is what I think we should do. And they're pretty receptive to that just because I'm spending obviously a lot of time with them. And, um, as they see his weight drop and his performance increase, you know, gaining trust with the coaches as well is also huge too, because they're also new to to me being there, and they're like, "Who's this dude that's just randomly showing up and is like now handling, you know, the performance and nutrition aspects of this camp?" So, <laughs> I try to be, I try to be as I don't want to step on any toes, but obviously I want the work to speak for itself, and um, and yeah, so that that's kind of how how I do it. It does change based off kind of how what they wake up at, how they're feeling how they're recovering and just making adjustments like that because that's the biggest thing. The point of me being there is to be able to, you know, adjust things and, and improve on things that we need to improve on. And so them being, you know, giving me that feedback just based off their biofeedback from their bodies and how they're responding, you know, to the high intensity training sessions, how they're recovering, how they're sleeping. It's all stuff we could dial in through food and nutrition. So yeah. I try to be on top of all that for them. Yeah. I guess now that you do have a little reputation behind you and a known experience is getting a buy-in from the coach easier than it used to be it used to be for sure because a lot of the time i wasn't doing camps because guys you know a lot of guys can't afford it and it's not like i'm charging crazy amounts but it's just guys you know guys can't afford to have someone come live with them and cook for them for seven eight weeks yeah um so I'd be working with, you know, just fight week. I'd help them throughout, you know, send them plans and help them throughout, throughout camp and then show up fight week, and I've had seven, eight guys on the card. And there'd be times where I'd have guys that are fighting each other, you know. So it's hard to break down, like, you're the, you're the weight cut guy at that point. You know, you're there to help them just cut that last bit of weight. And, you know, it's hard to build trust in, you know, five days um, when they're doing media, when they're doing all that. So it's, it's tough to do that in that in that time span but i do feel like obviously in the four weeks and especially if i could cook for him too like that's how that's how i get the coaches as well and and the significant others as well if i cook for them you know they're like oh he, he can come he can come he can come again next time you know dude what a lifestyle <laughs> what a lifestyle bro but i know it hasn't come easy but i want to know like, where did you grow up so i grew up all over the place um my parents are international school teachers so we grew up moving all over the world and traveling all over the world. Every three years, every four years, we'd be we'd be on the go and on on, on the fly. So, right. So literally, uh, like a a student of the world, really. Yeah, yeah. How grew up. I mean, grew up in Malaysia. Grew up in Peru, Venezuela, Czech Republic. Barely lived in the States. Barely lived in the States until I was eighteen. Lived in the States probably two years before I was eighteen and went to college. So. So what was, yeah. dri- what was driving your parents to want to move a family around so much? Were they just adventurous, they got, adventurous spirit? Yeah. They were just super adventurous. They, I mean, they taught in, you know, Reno, Nevada and Carson City, Nevada, which are awful places. Um, and they got an opportunity to go to Malaysia in like the late, I think, 80s and early 90s and they just fell in love with with the culture and the food and just being able to travel and just Southeast Asia in general and uh, really opened their eyes and they figured why not raise kids out here and you know expose them to this at an early age and you know so it's been that's why I'm here in Bali I've been coming to Bali since I was a baby you know we come here every Christmas and it's been my dream since I was three four years old to live here I'd always tell my dad I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna live here 
you know, I'm going to live here. So why it's, it's yeah. Why? why, why, why do you feel so drawn to it? Or why from the very start? From the very start, I was just a little beach bum kid. You know, I, I love to get in the ocean. I love catching waves and there was just a special energy here. You know, I, I've always been drawn to Bali. Just, I'd look forward to every Christmas and, you know, I'd, I'd cry when we had to leave and, you know, my parents would drag me to the airport. I'd just be like, just leave me here. Just leave me here. Uh, so, and I'm sure they thought about it a few times, but, um, but yeah, it's just been a special energy that I feel like I've been drawn to since I was a little bit, little boy, you know? And I, like I said, I was a baby when I first came here. I think I was one or two when the first time my parents brought me here. So I have old pictures of me and up, up in Ubud and like, you know, all these, all these old restaurants that are still, still up there today, you know, going, going to them and walking around in the kitchens. And I think that's where like my real love for food started with just being exposed to like different, different cuisines, cuisines. and different cultures. And yeah. yeah. So you would do your schooling at whatever school your parents were teaching at? Yeah, yeah. So okay. I'd, I'd, go, I'd go to all the schools that they taught at. Okay. And that would have been, for some people, they would consider that being very challenging, having to make new friends and things like that in different countries all the time. How, how did you cope with that aspect of it? I think the biggest thing was, you know, it was a fresh start, but I'd constantly be, you know, either you were leaving or your best friend was leaving. So it definitely changed the way, you know, I have relationships today just because I, I, I know people all over the world, but, you know, I'm always ready for someone to, you know, go off and do their thing. And it doesn't, I mean, with social media and everything, it's better now. But I mean, I remember, you know, losing or not losing, but my best friend moving when I was like four years old, five years old. And I remember those moments multiple times where I'd be in Peru and I'd make a best friend and then he'd come to school one day and be like, hey, I'm moving to Egypt. And you'd be like, what do you mean? <laughs> and then it just started to make, it started to become like more normal. And it definitely has affected, you know, the way I have relationships with people just because it's like everyone's always on the go and Bali is such a transient place too that like people are always on the move here so I do feel like I fit in a little better here just because you know people come and people go but um, I do think it made it a lot easier for me to jump into camps and you know being it's like a new kid right you show up to school brand new Got to kind of, got to kind of sell yourself to the to the other kids, but it's like Jamal. Like I, I showed up at his house, and he literally <laughs> thought I was gonna be a. He he said I, I thought you were gonna be a small little Asian guy. I was uh-huh. like, not that. <laughs> I was like, not that I know of, man. Well, he'd, never, he'd never seen you before? He'd never seen me before. He'd what? never seen me before. Yeah, he never seen me before. And I was like, no. Because you've been around for a while. I mean, you've worked with... I've been them. around, but he's... Yeah, I've worked, I've worked with a lot of guys. You've worked yeah, to, like, he just, DC. He, yeah, anyway. Yeah. Yeah, but he didn't know. So he was like, oh, <laughs> man, I thought, you're living in Asia. I don't know. I was like, yeah, I mean, I get it. I get it. But, how, yeah, how so it definitely helped me transition. How tall are you? How tall... Yeah. Six four. Six okay. four. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, so that's really interesting how it's sort of taught you how to be resilient maybe and adapt. Yeah. Very- resilient, adapt, and I just do feel like it's kind of just changed who I am just in terms of, you know, I was a new kid a lot and, you know, it's, it's made it easier to, to kind of just go around and move around and. It's definitely made me like I can't sit in one place, you know. Like, and my parents have that too. You know, the past Still. thirty years for them, they're always on the move, they're always on the go. You know, they'll spend you know six months in Lake Tahoe, they'll go to Florida, they'll go. You know, they're they're still on the move, and they come visit me. So it's definitely made me, you know, a man a man on the move, and uh, I am trying to find that like balance between, you know, being on the go and, you know, being a little bit more you know, steady and, and trying to find that, you know, happy medium between, you know, chasing everything, but also like being okay to like stay here and, you know, build, build something from here too. So I'm trying, I guess I'm trying to find that balance. Like every time I've spoke to you, you always refer to Bali as home. I'm at home. I'm going home. It's home. Yeah. Do you feel like when you, like Bali is your stable place now and it's like where, you know, you can get things in order. A hundred percent. I do uh, mentally. I mean, even if I even if I could just come home for two days, 
that's all I need. You know, take my daughter to the beach. You know, because I, this is where it all started. You know, I, I was working out, working and training at Bali MMA here when there was no other gyms. And we all really built and cut our teeth here, you know, before anyone ever cared. You know, we were all out here. We were all from different parts of the world. We were all away from family. But we all had dreams and goals and aspirations of making it in this sport, all in different aspects of it. But, you know, it's the biggest thing was like, nothing like I was no, I was nobody here we were sharing we called it the swamp house and because it was literally on a swamp and we'd have like monitor lizards that would come into the house and try to eat my dog what? and it was me and my dog were sharing that we were eating <laughs> nasi goring and like we were sharing half my you know half my food with my dog and eating the other half because we had nothing in Changu you know, area so yeah, we're right, right by, right by Bali MMA. We were like right behind, and there was like this swamp where people would burn garbage, and it was just like this nasty swamp. So we call it the Swamp House. And you know, having that mentality of like doing it for the love of the game, and you know, I was still working with you know a bunch of different fighters, but no one was making any money. We were just we were just scraping by. We were living off per diems, and you know, so it was one of those things that like Bali has always been the place where I could come and like regardless of what success I have you know I always will have that like mentality of like came from the swamp out here you know nothing nothing's really changed and uh my love of the game is still you know still real I, I still you know love this with with everything I have and this has been my goal since I was a little kid and you know coming back here and reminding myself that like regardless of the success I find and regardless of you know gold belts you know, the mission remains the same, and I think the biggest thing that I can do is try to be that influence that I needed, you know, be that one person that I needed growing up, and, you know, I I struggled a lot in school, you know, I was told by multiple teachers that, you know, I wasn't going to be very much, and I was told by a dietetics teacher in college that I should find a, you know, different different career path, and, you know, so the biggest thing is, like, I want to be that influence of, you know, someone that's like, hey, I struggled as well, and the struggle was real, but at the end of the day, I, you know, put my head down and did the work and, you know, built relationships with all these, all these super high-level guys, and, you know, it's, I'm nothing special, but I, I will sell my soul to this, and I am, I'm doing everything in my power to, you know, build this dream even further and, you know, make, make that little me proud, so I just, Bali has always done that for me. Regardless of the success I find, I could come back here hang out with my dog who could care less how many world titles I win you know and uh, go to the beach you know chill out and then write down whatever whatever we're, we're gonna do next so yes sir yes sir it's interesting then you said you said I don't even know if you realize you said it you said oh, I'm nothing special I don't know man I disagree I think the comment you made around um your teacher saying or your dietitian at college said, oh, maybe you should try something else. I had a similar experience when I was at high school. We had a careers counsellor said to me, oh, maybe it's time for you to leave school early and go and get a trade, you know, uh, become a... And I'm like, oh, I want to go to university. She's like, oh, I think maybe you should try and, you know, get into construction or something like that. And I was like, the first realisation went, oh, this chick thinks I'm dumb and not capable of anything. And it lit such a fire up my ass. But unfortunately, there's people that will accept those, those comments and let them dictate their life. And I feel that if you uh, have the self-belief to not listen to that negativity and rise above it, I think that's special. So I think you're special, man. <laughs> and I mean, that's the biggest thing too you know if you tell someone that you know that's something that they that's something that they could hold with them for the rest of their lives whether they use it as a positive influence or they can let it hold them back and so I feel like you got to be careful telling young kids you know if they if they learn differently than others like oh like I, I think you should you should you know expect to be something less than great yeah you know is, is that's the way I interpret telling someone you know like oh you should pick something else you know so it's like for a while I've, I you know I figured that they were right yeah but I did feel I did feel like there was something a little bit different you know I felt like I felt like in my heart and in my soul I'm like 
if I'm in control of this, I can do something different. You know, I, I can I can prove you wrong because you don't feel how I feel. And like you can you can on paper, okay, you can make some decisions if I you know, if I'm not clicking the same way that these kids are, I could see how you could you could think that, but you don't think like I do and you don't feel how I feel. So it's like and you won't work as hard as me. So it's like give me give give a kid like me an opportunity. I'm I'm gonna fuck I'm gonna shake it up. Yes, you, you know, are. give me give a kid like me an opportunity to make something of himself. You know, I'm 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 willing to put every piece of me into it. So, speaking of opportunities for kids, tell us about your ultra marathon last year across Bali. That changed my life. It was the toughest and the darkest places I've ever been. Um, I actually never ran a marathon up until that race. Um, it just happened to be two marathons back to back. So, so that's so. to clarify the distance. Can you do that for us? Yeah, I think it was like eighty. 87k something like that 83 84k and then it was one of those and then tell and then for those that don't know because there's people who are listening who don't know what's the average temperature you're running in you think in so de- do you know it, degrees celsius kind of so i mean the, the the good thing was the race started at night so it was it was you run through the entire evening so there was two start groups, well, three. There was one at six, one at eight, and one at ten. And um, so me being me, I was like, I'm going to start with everyone that's really good at this. So I'm going to go at ten and try to catch up with everyone. Um, and so it wasn't obviously we started like, I don't know if you're too fa- the listeners are too familiar with, with Bali <coughs> and like the landscape here. But we started in Lavina, so like you go up through like Singaraja, which is all mountains. So you have some gnarly, gnarly hills. The first, I think, 20, 20 km are all hills. 25 are all hills. So you're really cooking, and it's all super steep vertical. And cars can't even go up those back roads. Like cars were skidding out that were trying to film and record us. Um, and all like the, the pacers and everyone that were in the cars. Well, there weren't any pacers, but there was like... Um, people that are just helping and had like all like the water and everything um so yeah the first 20k were all all hills and i'd say it was about i only know degrees so it was probably like the coolest it got like up in the mountains was probably about 60 65 that was only because it was uh super overcast and cloudy and foggy and then as you ran through the night obviously it heated up and then by the time you finished i finished around like 8 a.m so it was it got hot and the sun was out and the sun was cooking by that say so around 90 degrees fahrenheit uh yeah i'd say by that point it's probably like 85 yeah, yeah. so for yeah. those that work in degrees celsius it's probably pushing 30 degrees celsius for Plus, most 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 of the world most of the world <laughs> so were you on your hydration game then I was. So I didn't tell too many people this, but I got like some gnarly food poisoning the night before. What? Yeah. And I don't know what it was because like the, the race provided food, so it wasn't from them. But I, I, like, I was trying to like, I was like, I need something that's high sodium and high carbs. So I was like, Indomie is perfect. <laughs> no, because, really? Because <laughs> just because it's high carbs, high, like it's just. <laughs> but I just have my my gut wasn't prepared for it. I was eating super clean, and I was like, I I'm so much better than this. But it was just like this lapse of just the finer details, which like I wouldn't ever risk with any of my clients. <laughs> I would never change anything flight day. But for some reason, I was like, you know what, Ian? It would be a good idea to just to test the durability of our gut and throw in some into me and. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I tried. <laughs> what mid race? I tried mid race or no, before, before the race? No, before the wa- before the race. <laughs> I was uh, I was I was in the bathroom all day with demons and uh, <laughs> yeah, they were they were screaming. They were screaming. So th- in my head, mentally, I was like, "This is not a valid excuse because you did this. You did this to yourself." <laughs> and uh, so yeah, I just had to I just had to suck it up and. Hydrate as much as I could, and yeah, hope there was going to be some bushes along the way. Oh my god! Especially if you'd been eating clean, and then like Indomie noodles and the sachets that you put with them, it's just all artificial flavors and colors and process. Yeah, it's just it's hot garbage to be honest. So, 
I just, I just figured, like, I was just, like, get a bulk load of sodium, you know, fast-burning carbs, like, super refined carbs, and just slurp them down. I just drank it like it was, like, a, a drink, and I got, like, three or f- three or four in, like, a like a, a cup and just slammed it. And then, yeah, like, three or four hours later, it was, like, we're out of here, dude. <laughs> but, yeah. So, but yeah, it was... It was I want to ask you though, why did you feel compelled to do that ultra marathon? Like I know you were running for a charity, but yeah. Yep. Why? Ultimately, obviously the challenge. Um, I think the biggest thing obviously was the challenge of it, but just my mental state when I, when I signed up for the race, I was in Nashville, um, was, was working with a client where I was making a lot of money, but I wasn't super happy. You know, I was in a relationship that I shouldn't have been in. And I just needed something to look forward to that was going to, like, strip me down. And I felt like it was going to tell me the direction I need to go in. You know, I felt like in the moments where I'm, like, most exhausted and most challenged, I do feel like I do get some sense of purpose and, like, guidance. And I was just ready to do the work that was going to go into that to kind of distract me from the situation I was in, but also give me something to look forward to. And it was something that I didn't see myself finishing. You know, I knew I was going to finish, but, like, the person I was at that moment I signed up for would have, like, wasn't going to do it, you know? So it was, like, this thing that I needed to challenge myself to, commit to. And once I kind of, you know, put the deposit down and, and signed up for it, I'm like, well, you're either doing it and dying or doing it in shining. So <laughs> it's up to you, dude. So. Yes. Yeah. And I love the charity that you selected to run for. The, is the Bali Children's Foundation, correct? Yeah, Bali Children's Foundation. And luckily with the athletes that I, that I work with, you know, we were able to raise 10000 U.S. dollars, to, you know, to, to help, you know, fund education here in Bali and help, you know, help put kids in a position to, you know, change the trajectory of their lives. And, you know, that was always in the back of my mind. You know, the opportunities that I've been given, you know, through my parents' support, you know, you know, giving me a great education gr- growing up. And then, you know, where I'm from, you know, I, those are things that we don't choose. So obviously I lucked out and, you know, got, got a lot of good in my life. And so I wanted to, you know, give an opportunity to put everything on the line myself to, you know, a little bit of struggle for me, for someone that, you know, won't have the opportunities that I have um, is an easy decision for me. It's, it's, it's a couple miles, you know, a couple sore legs. It is what it is. I, 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 do, it, I do it right now to help someone. So, yeah. and I'm not in running shape right now. So You're not. I mean. <laughs> well, I mean, but at least that far, you know, it was so, so much so much work that goes into training for something like that and you know there's so many variables just in that distance you know obviously with the end of me that being one thing I broke my foot during it um I sprained my ankle at the halfway point and had yeah I had four stress fractures in my foot and in my shin um so I had to dig deep I had to dig really deep and uh yeah cried a lot on that run not because of pain not because of pain but just because I was in such a mental <clears throat> it was such a mental roller coaster. Mm. You know, I was alone for a good five hours of that race, just me and my headlamp and shuffling feet. Mm. And, you know, I really got to have some conversations with myself that I needed to have. And that, that was my biggest takeaway from it. You know, I, I love to do challenging things. Um, and that race definitely challenged me and, you know, stripped me down to my core. And I got to, you know, have conversations with, you know the person I I know I happen to work you know with world champions get to be around around world champions but that's just what I do you know it's not who I I, re, I realize that's not who I am and so getting to have those conversations with myself and figuring out exactly who I am and what direction I need to go and I realize that like I am here on this earth to serve you know I'm here to be of service to other people and at the end of the day like I know I say. It's not about anything besides besides me. Like the gold belts are cool, all that is cool, but like if I can have a powerful impact on you know some kid that sees that I struggled in school too, and you know he doesn't need obviously doesn't need to be a nutritionist for UFC fighters, but whatever his dream is, you know whatever he wakes up at night 
and like feels in the pit of his stomach and in his heart that like this is what I'm this is what I'm here for. You know, I want to be that reason and like that example. And um, that's what that race that's what that race really showed me. Is like I'm I'm here to let people know that I am, and I will continue to say it regardless of how many people tell me I'm special because I am nothing special. <laughs> I am just really willing to work really, really fucking hard for everything I have, and I'm willing to put it all on the line. And, you know, I, I'm different in that way, but everything besides hard work and just putting my soul into every little ounce of thing, I, every, every single ounce I have into it, and then try to put myself in a position to win. And, um, uh, yeah, so that race taught me a lot, and I'm, I got to do it again. My goal was sub ten hours, um, and I, I ended up finishing in like ten hours and I think fifty one minutes or something. So, <coughs> got to run it back. Got to do it again. No window me, no broken feet. Um, so, got to do it again. Wow, I might join you. I'm serious. But on another note, you, you know, you're mentioning you found, you know, you want to be of service and things like that. Can you hear me? Sorry, can you say that one more time? Yeah, I just want to, I want to just unpack some of the things you said a little bit. I I feel that you have found your niche, you know, you found something that you enjoy and you're good at, which is uh, an accomplishment in itself. And I kind of just want to figure out how you how you did that and how you discovered that. So if we go back to your early days, you know, as a young person traveling the world with your family, uh, did you then finish high school and go straight to university? Hello. Say, so, hang on, so you cut off. Let me let me move because for some reason it keeps cutting off. Yeah. This damn remote. This no, but listen, just so internet. you know. Yeah, no, no, but just so you know... All right, let's see if um, it's any better. Okay, just so you know, with this program, what are we at, 38 minutes? With this program, it's recording end-to-end, and also the visual will be different in the final recording uh, because it's recording end-to-end. So that means okay. if it does glitch, because it, it's not like Zoom, if it's going glitchy, it doesn't matter because it's... It's still your computer itself is still picking up the audio, and at the end of it, I'll get a separate track, and then I will edit the glitch. There'll be no glitch. So, if it starts to get shaky, right, just keep talking. Okay. <coughs> Does that make sense? Okay. <coughs> yeah. 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 No, it's back now. Okay. For some reason, it was. Yeah. Oh, good. Was just all so over I get. The place. That's all good, man. <laughs> I think it's good that this, the sound quality for a, for a remote recording is quite good. So I'm just looking at the levels and stuff. It's fine. Uh, I'm just going to make a marker point. Edit 40 minutes. Okay. I want to I wanna go back into your time, that period of time. So from finishing high school, tell me about your life from oh, – no, actually, no, no, no. At – I want to go back to the fighting stuff. Did you ever want to be a fighter yourself? So, I liked the idea of it, um, but early on, I kind of saw, I kind of saw the bigger picture. Um, I like to train, I like to compete, but I just saw a lot of the damage a lot of these guys were taking that were done fighting. Yeah. And I just didn't. I just didn't see it being worth it for me. Um, so I loved it. Like I loved. I, like I still train to this day. But I just wanted to be part of it. But didn't want to, you know, step inside that that cage to compete for a living. Like I love to compete. But yeah, it wasn't my it wasn't my goal to ever, um, you know, do that to provide for my family. Okay. So then. At what point did you sort of go, okay, I like the training. I want to sort of understand how your journey into nutrition came about. Was it post high school? So my journey into nutrition came from when I first started. It was, well, it was actually during during high school um, was when I first started training. And I just remember seeing all my, like, all my friends that trained and fought just having rough weight cuts. Um, you know, running, 
running their weight off, crying while they're doing it, you know, asking the coach to make them stop running. Um, and, you know, you know, he'd hand them an apple and tell them to go to bed and come back tomorrow morning and do it all over again. And so that was when I was like, this can't be the only way. That There's no way that this is the way to do it or this is the most efficient way to do it. Um, so I really, I, that's where I really opened my eyes to be like, maybe I could do this. Like, maybe I could be the guy. Um, and then I realized that there was a couple guys doing it um, that were, you know, doing it somewhat the right way at the time. Um, and it kind of opened my eyes to the fact that I don't have to fight to be involved with the sport. I don't have to coach to be involved with the sport. Um, and I always loved cooking. So it was one of those things where I was like, this is, a, you know, all of my passions right now where it was like cooking, you know, MMA. And, you know, I, I love nutrition just because it, it was the way I could incorporate it into food was something that also interests me. So I was like, it's a no-brainer. This is all, all my passions combined. And then I realized, I mean, obviously travel as well, where it's like I got like, you know, the trifecta and then I got, you know, travel attached to that where it's like I can do everything I love, um, keep all my brain cells for the most part and, uh, and still be able to, you know, be involved with the sport. Yeah, nice. So who was the first pro fighter you ever worked with or was approached by? The first pro fighter I ever worked with was Sergio Pettis. That was the first, the first fighter I ever worked with, yeah. Amazing. <laughs> yeah, the first pro was... I was working with a couple guys in Thailand... Yeah. that were pro Muay Thai fighters but the first pro MMA fighter and the only reason I got that opportunity was because his nutritionist at the time couldn't make it missed his flight last minute and then I followed him on Twitter and had, and had been pestering him to hire me and give me like give me an opportunity and it was only because of that you know it was, wow. I've been messaging him on Twitter since high school no way yeah. so you so were cold you were cold it was cold. last yeah on Twitter yeah, <laughs> on Twitter, and he just he messaged me one day while I was in class in Vegas. Um, actually, no, I was I was actually busing tables at a pizza place, and um, I got a message, and he's like, "Hey, are you in Vegas?" I'm like, "Yeah, what's up?" And he's like, "Can you work with Sergio Pettis this weekend?" And it was like Monday, and like, he's like, "He gets in tomorrow. Can you handle all his food throughout the week? I'll send you what to do." Um, and Dude. It was like I was like I will do everything. You Did need you to just do. like just let me know? <laughs> and um, yeah, he messaged me and uh, got me in contact with Sergio. And Sergio is still my client today. You know, he's a Bellator world champion. He's one of my he's one of my best friends. We talk every day. Um, shit, and we've been we've been friends for over you know nine years now. We were both twenty one years old at the time. Both young. You know, young young men in the sport. He grew up in the UFC. You know, now he's Bellator champion. Um, and yeah, we were both 21 years old. Actually, no, I think we were both 20 years old because it was the 20th anniversary show of the UFC. It was GSP versus Johnny Hendricks, and we were both 20 years old. So it was 20, 20, and then GSP versus Johnny Hendricks. Dude. So it felt like it was meant to be. It felt like it was meant to be. All the numbers lined up, and uh, and yeah, Sergio's one. Yeah, like I said, he's one of my best friends. I talk to that dude every day, and uh, to see him still shining and you know making his making his mark on the sport, and um, it's awesome to see. We've we've grown up doing this, and uh, yeah, it's nine years of friendship and nine years of you know working at this together, and uh, we're both we're both we're both shining. So it's 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 cool. It's cool to see. Yeah, you are. Wow. Okay, so after you worked with Sergio, like, did things start to really build from there in terms of getting a reputation as someone to have in their fight camp? I wish. It definitely, definitely, (laughs) I thought it would, you know, when it it happened, I was like, my life's going to change, and it definitely did not, you know, it was quite the opposite, um... As much as it meant to me, it really didn't mean too much to anybody else. Um, so it was a it was a good reminder for me that like you're not even there yet, dude. Like you're just scratching you're you're not even scratching the surface. You're not even <laughs> you're still rock bottom. Um, so 
after Sergio, I actually went out to Thailand because um, I had plans to go out there to Tiger Muay Thai, and I did a, an internship at the cafe there. Um, again, I was cold calling through social media and uh, reached out to the, one of the chefs there. Um, he was from New York, and he, he ended up in Thailand, and he was you know in control of the cafe at Tiger Muay Thai. Um, had no background in nutrition, but obviously background in culinary arts, so he obviously knew how to cook and build, build the menu and do all the costing, but had no idea how to you know put together nutrition plans and all that. So he gave me room on board and, uh, and an opportunity to train for free if I did all that for him. So I flew out right after Sergio's fight and uh, stayed in the Tiger Muay Thai dorms and stayed with all the fighters and you know, handled all their food, all their nutrition, and that's really where I kind of started to, you know, make it my lifestyle because I was like, I'm all in. I was, I was there for the next four months. You know, I was making zero money, sleeping on floors with cockroaches. Um, it wasn't as bad as the swamp, but uh, it was pretty. It was pretty damn close. Um, so that's really where I kind of started to, I guess, pick up a little bit of little bit of momentum. But still, it was fighters that really no one no one cared too much about just because it was Muay Thai. Those guys were fighting all the time. They weren't making any money. Um, so I guess Thailand is kind of where it all kind of started to get off the rock bottom and, and try to swim my way up to the top. Off the rock bottom. Yes, I love these sort of stories, dude. I love them. Yeah, I, I think I know that you work with these... <laughs> I know that you work with DC, like Daniel Cormier, at yeah. one stage. Is that correct? Yeah, I actually worked with him for five five fights. All his fights at heavyweight and one fight at light heavyweight. Wow, man. Was that pretty insane experience for you at the time? For sure, because it was one of the bigger, obviously it was one of the biggest fights um, and most popular fighters at the time. So... I was I moved back to the states, so I moved from Bali back to the states full time because I was starting to get these opportunities, and no one was willing to fly me from Bali at the time. Mm -hmm. So I was like, I gotta go back home, gotta be back in Reno. So the guy that I was working for, George Lockhart, um, isn't the best at answering his phone. Um, so I moved my whole life. I spent all my money to smuggle my Bali dog back to Reno. Literally all my money, like three hundred and seventeen dollars that I had, I put that all into getting my dog back and putting a putting a return flight on my credit card that I would eventually pay off. Eventually pay off, and um, got back to Reno. Didn't hear a word from Lockhart. Didn't hear one word. Months went by, and I was like messaging him. I was like, man, this dude made me move move out here so he could just take me out of the game and like. <laughs> make me he was trying to take me out um but so I got a job at the UFC gym I was coaching some kids jiu-jitsu and um and then out of nowhere just he reached out and started putting me on every single card I was you know one weekend I was in you know Toronto one weekend I was in you know Calgary one week then it just started speed you know it wow. started speeding up from there and then Daniel Cormier was a guy that, you know, they worked with and, you know, he he called called me and they offered me the spot and it was crazy. You know, I was I was literally working at the UFC gym and trying to juggle all this and like leave on the weekends for fights and you know, when so when D C called and, you know, they're like, Can you go out to San Jose for the next five weeks? I was like Of course. I walked in, you know, walked in the to work that day, quit. Um, and threw everything in my car and drove down to drove down to San Jose and, you know, it was it was crazy because DC was a guy I watched since I I mean I took a picture with him at the fan expo when I was you know in in high school I waited in line to take a picture with that guy so it was a surreal moment when I was packing my bags and like packing up my knives to go go live with him for the next five weeks it was one of those moments that like the entire drive I tried to really take that whole drive in and realize that like I'm I'm literally driving towards a life-changing opportunity that's you know going to change the whole trajectory of my life if I do if I do what I know how to do and if I you know put my heart into it and 
<coughs> and it was yeah, it was, I was ner- I was nervous because I knew he was picky, and I knew he was I knew he was tough to work with, but um, it was just it was just a matter of getting there and showing him what I could do, and I, I knew I knew my work would take care of itself, but I I was still super nervous because I'm like he's super picky. What if he doesn't like me? Um, so all those all those conversations you have with your head whether it's imposter syndrome or mm. you know any of those things where I, I really felt like that was my opportunity to change my life and I put all that pressure on myself but pressure makes diamonds so I need I need yes, I need sir. to be I need I need to be a diamond that day yes sir was he hard to work with uh, at he first? Was, he was particular. He was very particular, and I I figured exactly the kind of foods that he liked. And the one thing I was good at was like, he loved Thai food. So I was like, man, I this is this is perfect for me. So I made all types of clean Thai food. You know, he loved you know food from Louisiana, so gumbo. So I was you know researching gumbo and different gumbo recipes and ways to make it healthy and ways to make it you know fight camp friendly. And so when when some you know <laughs> skinny white kid shows up to your house and Tells you he can make he can make gumbo like like back in Louisiana, he didn't believe it, but it was something that he requested all the time, and you know I'd make it for his family when they came, and it was something that, you know, breaking down those walls through food is I feel like the fastest way to, you know, build friendships and build trust, and you know, so I do feel like having that in my back pocket is one way to, you know, get love from these guys. Connect, bro. Exactly, regardless of culture, you know, language. Food brings people together, and you know, regardless of the magnitude of how big the fights are, you know, a good meal with the team, you know, that's 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 what could set set off like a right, you know, a right energy or a bad energy, and you know, so. Mm. Uh, yeah, um, when you say that you lived with him and live with these fighters, like, were you actually living like on his premises, like in yeah, a no, room, was- a room in the house? Yeah, I was sleeping in his guest room. Yeah, I was sleeping in his guest room right next to his room. You know, there'd be yeah, we we had a fight camp house where I was on an I was on an air mattress and he was on a on like a king size bed next to me because we were like it was just like the fight camp house and we'd all it was just like grimy and we just get in like the just focus on the fight and like it was one of those things where we just all got to be in the same house together, six guys training partners, strength conditioning coaches, and we were all just in, in the same place and just, you know, one, one goal in mind, and that's getting D.C. to the, to the fight as healthy and uh, as ready as possible. So, yeah, yes. we, 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 we'd, all, we'd all prepare for war together. If we fast forward to the last fight camp you are in, which was with Yair Rodriguez, if you had to now compare that event to the very, very first one that you attended, how would you compare them? Do you still get the same feelings that you had when, oh. when, your, fighter walk, when your fighter walks out? <coughs> is it the same? Or is it, are you a bit more jaded with it? No, I, I still get anxiety through the roof. I'm shaking. My, my, I can't stop stomping my foot. Like, my foot would be like... <laughs> but... Um, the first, I mean, I didn't get a ticket to the fight that Sergio fought on because he was a prelim fighter and he had two tickets and, like, he gave one to his, his mom and one to, I think, his, his cousin came to. And so I had to go to, no, I didn't have to go. I went to a Buffalo Wild Wings, which is, like, a, a sports bar in, in the States, <laughs> and I watched the fight there. And I had my UFC wristband on because I was so proud that I was backstage with Sergio when he weighed in. That I, I wore it for like a week, um, <laughs> and so that was my first event. I watched it from a buffalo, a packed Buffalo Wild Wings in Las Vegas, Nevada, and fast forward to Perth. You know, last last week I was sitting cage side watching, you know, Yair win a title, just as nervous, um, but equally as proud of of, of both those dudes. Um, so that hasn't changed. And my love, you know, my love for the sport, still the same. Just a little bit closer, a little bit closer to the cage. Um, and but yeah, I'm still, I'm still that that little fight nerd 
that uh, yes. you know geeks out, geeks out over big fights, and I constantly have to pinch myself and remind myself that you know that kid that kid that was told he wasn't going to be very much sh- is shaking up a little bit. You know, he's shaking yes. things up a little bit. Dude, because you get to go to all the press conferences as well and stuff like that, yeah? Yeah, yeah, so get to go to those. Those, I try, like, uh, the fights, and at, at the end of the day, like, I'm not huge. Like, I, I get super nervous when I go to the fights, so I don't love going to the fights. You know, I don't like the feeling of having to see people I care about, you know, fight for a better life. But, you know, a lot of these guys love to compete, love to go out there, and, you know, I've been on both ends. You know, I've been on world yeah. title losses, you know, I've been to after parties of, of both, you know. And then the truth <laughs> of the matter is there's a hell of a lot less people at those at those losses. You know, those 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 are where the true friends, family, supporters are. You know, it's easy to go to the party of a guy that wins. Yeah. You know. It's not easy to go sit there after someone, you know, dreams just got, you know, crushed in front of the whole world and, you know, they got hurt, they got damaged, you know. It's one of those mm. things that uh yeah, it's it's a it's a rough sport, so it's tough it's tough to sit there and obviously it's the best feeling in the world when they do well, but it's one of, it's one of the worst and uh, toughest things to watch when they don't. You must by default fall into a counseling role all the time, especially now that you've had so much experience. Like, there's probably fighters that you work with where you've actually been to more UFC events than them, obviously. So sure. you're more, you're, it's more of a familiar environment to you than them. So I'm sure that they're probably looking to you sometimes for advice. Would that be safe to say? For sure. And I mean, I mean I'm 29, so a lot of the time I'm working with people that are older than me. Like there's been only a few times where I've worked with people that are younger than me. Um, me and Yair are about the same age. He's 30, so he's about a year older than me. Um, so it's a weird position to be in because it's people you look up to, right? Whereas people that I've, I've watched right here since he won the Ultimate Fighter. You know, I've watched DC since I was in high school. So being in a position to kind of tell them what to do and ways to improve and ways to, you know, but it works both ways. You know, I've been around DC and I've seen his business moves that he makes and like, you know, how hard he trains and the way he handles family matters and, you know, the way he handles adversity, the way he handles pressure. It's all, all things that I can incorporate into my life because very few people get different looks into different camps. You know, a lot of these guys have one camp, and that's all they do, but I go from multiple camps, different, you know, to see different coaching styles, see different, you know, aspects of all, all I guess, the way guys look at the sport. And um, so I pick each thing that I can from that and try to apply that to my life. And that's one thing that I really applied to the run was, like, at the end of the day, it's just a run. But, like, the mindset that, was, that goes into it, I picked up from, you know, watching DC get ready for a title fight, watching Luke, Luke Rockhold get ready for a title fight. You know, so it's one of those things where it's, like, I can pick, I can pick small moments in the sport where people don't see and I could apply that to my life because these people are ultra successful and and those are the moments that mean the most to me because obviously the stuff that people see on TV everyone sees so it's like it's not special but like the drives to the gym where me and DC had heart to heart you know conversations about the future and about what we want for ourselves and what we want for our fam- our future families or his family you know those moments that I get to share and that like I step back wow. on and I really and I really go like damn like this this was meant to be because I, I, I built this I built my life around this, but I try to take a step back and really realize how special those moments are because all that other stuff is cool, but sharing sharing those moments with the people that mean a lot to you are is more important than than the stuff we do, you know. <coughs> those those little moments that uh you know no one knows about and we hold we hold special to our hearts just because, you know, it's just me and him or it's just you know, just the, the five guys in the house and, like, us playing video games. And, you know, it's it's one of those things that, you know, I try to look back on those moments. And those are some of my favorite moments, for sure. Just those those days where we'd laugh for, you know, 12 hours a day on a Sunday where it's just, like, we just barbecue and talk some shit. And I'm like, this is, this is crazy. Like, uh, I would never... 
I'd never believe it if if you told me you know you're gonna you're gonna be living with DC for eight weeks, ten weeks while he's getting ready for a world title fight. You're gonna be barbecuing and, and talking about the future together. It's like wow, it's, it's crazy. It's crazy. You know, being around that energy all the time. What are some common personality traits you've noticed now or trends of successful people? Because, I mean, if I relate my own experience, <coughs> I'm, I'm starting to identify commonalities between, with successful people and the things, yeah. the, one, the one to two percent differences between them and someone else. Are you, with these fighters, are you starting to be, uh, identify the differences that they, that they possess? For sure. I mean, the ultra-successful guys are always, always have something going on. There's always a new challenge in front of them. There's always, what's next? What's next? There's never like a, oh, I'm going to take 10 days and, and chill. There's no, like, there's no chill. There's always like, there's got to be a goal. There's got to be something in the horizon. And uh, that's one thing I've really picked up on, like, whether it's like DC with his coaching or his business moves or Jamal, like with his, with him, like his training and like what he's looking at next or a guy like Paul Felder, like even when he's done, when he's done fighting, you know, he's training like a professional athlete, you know, he's trying to be the best in the world in in his age group in a sport that he just started, but he's training. Yeah. Triathlon. Yeah. And he trains, he trains harder now and he's more dialed in than he was when he fought, you know? Obviously, he fought, but, like, fighting, you can only train so hard. But, like, Paul will go on a 15-mile run and then do a 40-mile bike ride and then do a 5-mile swim. Like, he's just he's just out, like, he's just dialed in, and he wants to be the best age grouper. Like, obviously, he's not going to go pro and, like, you know, do that, but he, he wants to be the best in his age group. And yeah. to him, that's what he sets his sights on. You know, so like being around people that are so goal oriented and like just go all in on everything. I hold I I think like that too. But it's just like that's what I've noticed, like a lot of these guys have the habit of you know, and and he's gotta juggle commentating as well, where he's you know, he's say. commentating <coughs> so trying to be, be the be the best at that, you know, and he's he'll a great commentate. commentator. Hmm. He is, he's a great and he's acting as well. So he's getting to acting and you know he's 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 on TV shows now. He's got he does a new comedy that he's like he plays an MMA fighter and um, and yeah he's doing that. He's on, he, I think they're on the third season, so I think they're starting to have him you know be a more be more regular on the show. And so I guess it's just a cool thing is just being around people that you know are always chasing what's next. You know bigger bigger goals. You know and. Uh, I do feel like that's made me a better a better person just because I can I can make sense of it a little bit more because a lot of my friends are like oh like you should just slow down and chill I'm like momentum is real and I didn't work ten years and throw ten years of my youth away you know to get here kick my feet up drink a coconut you know and, and chill like I'll do that for a couple hours but like at the end of the day we gotta figure out what's next and what the next goals are because complacency is is something that you know isn't really in my vocabulary so i i am never gonna sit here and be like this is i'm the guy because i'm not i i, I was the guy last weekend yeah, you for were. about thir- for about 30 seconds but that goes away people forget and it's right back to work yes and you know being around that all the time it's like it's your new normal you know and it's like the the measure has changed. The scale's changed. That's your new baseline, <laughs> which is it's really tough. exciting. It's it's tough. It's probably tiring, and you're probably learning how to manage burnout and stuff like that now too. Yeah, yeah. I mean the burnout thing is real, and the it tough is. thing too is not getting too emotionally invested in the outcome of it because at the end of the day, I can do everything in my power to put them in the best position to be successful, but I can't control what goes on. It's a, it's a it's a cage fight at the end of the day. Anything can happen. And so if I'm attached to them winning the belt, and I'm like, oh, my life changes as soon as I get this guy wins this belt. It really doesn't. Obviously, it looks great on paper, but at the end of the day, you know, it's, 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 one of the, it's a fickle sport. So it's one of those things like, oh, people will always message you, oh, congratulations, he won the belt. But it's like him making weight and him performing well is my job. 
So him winning the belt is that that's good for them. Obviously, yeah. it looks great for my career, but at the end of the day, it's like my job isn't you know for them to go out there and win. My job is to get them in the best position possible to go out there and perform well, and ultimately their 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 job is to go out there and win. But so, I try not so, to. Like, Attach myself to the outcome, but I still do. Yeah. To be honest. <laughs> <laughs> so you're you, you're having your small victory when they make weight and they have a good weight cut. Exactly, exactly. That yeah. to me. But then obviously they, they have to go out there and perform because they could have a good weight cut. It could be everything could be going great, but then after that, it doesn't mean much if they you know the rehydration and the reload don't go well, and then they go out there and you know feel sluggish and slow, and then. You know, don't don't go out there and feel feel great. So, my job, I feel like my job isn't over until they go out there and perform well. You know, yeah. I'm nervous. I'm nervous the entire time, but like I know that I did my job. You know, when they go out there and, and put on a great fight and you know look great, but ultimately my job is to get them to the scale as healthily as possible, mm. and and rehydrate them and refuel them as much as as much as we can in that time frame <coughs> and then um the rest is up to them but yeah still it's so anything can happen you don't you don't feel like you failed them when they lose you're not you're not carrying those kind of feelings are you i mean of course i mean the, the, i asked myself what i could do better what i could have done better you know we yeah. all have those the, those voices of like it being ways i could have improved like i'll always ask myself that whether they do good or not you know, yeah. I had that, I had that talk with Jamal. You know, what what can I do better? What can I do better for you? Um, and same with Yair. It's one of those things where it's like, how can I be better for you? Um, it's just like going back after a fight and watching film. You know, you you go you watch the fight, talk to the coaches, see what we could do better, mm-hmm. um, and go back to the drawing board. And you know, don't don't take too much of, you know, the the great things you did, and look look at the things that you could improve on, and. Um, yeah. And yeah, I, I look at it like I'm like I'm a professional athlete. You know, I look at it ways I could improve, ways I could ways I could grow, and ways I can stay relevant. You know, it's because everyone wants everyone wants you know to be in my position. And uh, as much as I'd love to, you know, have everyone be doing this, you know, I'm I'm trying to build my dream house here, and uh, I'm not quite there yet. So, gotta keep <laughs> gotta yes, keep sir. plugging away. Yeah, it's so true. It's such a it's such a niche, like I said, it's such a niche role you found yourself in. Well, you've worked yourself into, I should say. And I think what I've sort of discovered with you is it's not about you. It's not about the food. Like when an athlete has you, they, it seems like they they're getting a someone who's making their meals, but also a training partner, friend yeah. and count and friend and counselor. So it's so much. It seems like it's so much more than the food and the nutrition, right? It's so much uh, more. Yeah, yeah that's why it takes that. a lot out of me during those camps because, you know, like I said, I'm spending pretty much 24 hours a day with them besides the time that we sleep. Wake up, yeah. you know, be the first person to say good morning and, you know, usually be the last person to say good night to them. So it's one of those things where, like, I'm handling every aspect of, the day, of their day, yeah. trying yeah. to make it easier from the second they wake up, you know. Yeah. So... What, it what takes, do you a do lot, you, takes a lot out of me. <laughs> what do you do if you catch a fighter eating something they shouldn't be? Do you give I them shit? Pull, oh, for sure, <laughs> I give them shit. But then I'll then, then I'll pull it out of their food. So what if they if they complain <laughs> about you know about them eating less that day, I'm like, well, yeah. this, is, this is a 300 calories. You know, you you snuck and and <laughs> yeah, we, we, I'm, I'm I'm the tax guy. You know, I I get my I get my taxes. That's hilarious. Hey, man, UFC 284, how does the Australian or how did the Australian crowd rate to other crowds you've seen around the world? It was wild. they got to be up there with number one. It's, it's, it's got to be up there with the best. They, I, I think the Perth crowd is, you know, super underrated. I'd, I'd say they, they're top, top three easily. Yeah, yeah. Top I mean, obviously top three, but I th- I'm, I'm guessing Brazil's up there. Uh, not really. I mean, Brazil, Brazil, they're loud, but they're not, <coughs> they're not consistent. You know, they'll, once they start losing, they, they get pissed and they start booing and then they, they sit down. They all shit, right? Yeah, they're all gone. They're, 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 they're <laughs> kind of, they're kind of, they're kind of a, a soft crowd. Um, 
London. London's up there. Crazy. But I, I'd say I'd say Perth is probably. I mean, they gotta be in recent in recent memory. It's gotta be number one. Yeah. It was crazy. Listen, listen. Like I mean, obviously I wanted Volk to win that fight. Okay, against Islam. I, I mean, mm-hmm. for sure. And watching it at home on TV. You know, I, I must admit, I honestly did feel like Islam won the fight, maybe three rounds to two. But I am very aware of the fact that when you're cage side and you're in the arena, you know, watching a fight, it, it can be a very, very different perspective. Am I right? So, for sure. You know, what was the? I mean, obviously the crowd wanted Volk to win, but what was the general feel after watching it when the decision was made? How? What do you think? I mean. It was close, you know. It was close. It just depends how you score control. Mm. It's just I I had Islam up, but that fifth round, like I was like, man, maybe he just snagged it because that was a big round. Um, the crowd obviously had was wanted wanted Volk to win, and that obviously had an influence on a lot of the people there just because every little thing he did was like you get a crowd response you know so i feel like that kind of changed the way my perception of it just because i was like just picking up that crowd energy and i was surprised why the judges didn't pick up on that either because i mean their, their scores were kind of all over the board um like i don't they didn't have it a couple of judges didn't have it three two did they Oh, I know it was, a, it was like I don't know. I don't know. It was a unanimous decision in the end. I, I don't. Yeah, I, I know. It was, I know it was a unanimous, but I, 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 I know there was maybe only one judge that scored it three two, and like okay. I think one judge scored it four one or something. It was it was a weird scorecard where I was like, I don't think that he picked it up just because of the way they were scoring yeah. it. But I mean, at the end of the day, control is control. Um, mm-hmm. The crowd was incredible. I just wish Volk did a little bit more. When he was yeah. up, because it's just, it's tough to it's but obviously you got Islam on your back. What can you do? You know you just got to avoid that yeah. situation even before it happens. But I think there should be a rematch. You know yeah. they got to run that one back, do it in Abu Dhabi. But I know I know I mean that puts Yair on the shelf then. So they got to figure out what to do with that featherweight belt. You know so hopefully you know he comes back down and does featherweight and then figures it out but I think yeah it's going to be a problem at that weight class so we'll his see perfor- his performance that night was impeccable he was he, I, it was something special yeah it was something special and uh, that dude deserves it because he's he's the UFC has been you know big on him for a while but the fact that he got his first submission you know he he went out there and every shot Every shot he threw was, you know, did damage. Every single shot, you know, that body kick in the first, that cat, that calf kick that he hurt him with. Dude. Yeah, he was he was throwing he was throwing to hurt him every time, and you know he had Josh fighting for his fighting for his life in the beginning. You know, like he he just had that right hand, and then each punch he landed was like you saw his health bar just drain, 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 and yeah. it was like a video game. You just saw each shot he threw hurt him, and. uh yeah, I, I still I'm interested to look at that because the UFC because I was sitting right next to his parents, and mm-hmm. the UFC does like their thrill and agony thing, where they like show like the winning and the losing fighters and their families. The camera was like right on me, so I don't know how much usable footage was was salvaged from that, <laughs> but <laughs> I, because I I don't I blacked out like I don't know what I was saying. Um, I would just so uh, yeah. Well, we'll see. We'll see what we'll see what I what exactly I said and who who I got mad because. Uh, but yeah, even, even yeah, yeah, was on his back at one stage, and even he he was elbowing from from his Those back. Those elbows were so violent. I was like, what? Right. <laughs> and he, like he was arching too, his too, back and. So yeah, I, I said Emmett's bald too. So like he was just throwing those to the top of the head and just doing damage with all those shots and every single shot he threw hurt him like everywhere he threw from was just bad intentions you usually just bad, don't see that bad outside. intentions yeah yeah it just seems like the nicest guy to you know he's a good I dude mean, he's yeah he's a good dude yeah he's a he's a hard worker and 
Is he super talented though? Super super talented. Athletic a- athletic as can be. How'd you get him to Bali though? Because I know he spent a week in Bali before he got to Perth, right? He was just coming out here. Like he he was supposed to go to Perth and then like <laughs> realize how close Bali was. And was like, oh, I'm just going to do Bali. And then they reached out to me because they knew I was in Bali. And then we got them all sorted at the gym. And, uh, yeah, it was, just, it, was, it was just meant to be. And they messaged me on the flight back from Brazil. So I was like, I got a, fly, I got a message. And I was like, hey, they were like, hey, we're Gayer Rodriguez Management, blah, blah, blah. We're interested in inquiring about you working with Gayer for his title fight. And I was still coming off, the, you know, the high of Jamal. Jamal's fight so I was like I kind of had to sit back and be like is this really happening like and I was like had to ask myself I was mentally like prepared to like jump right back into a title camp and like you know so I said yes immediately before I thought of any of that but it was a thought somewhere somewhere it was a thought (laughs) yeah yeah yeah, and Volkanovski possibility I think I don't know with Volk like I mean I, yeah yeah is going to be problematic there's no doubt about it but I guess just with Volk he just cannot be underestimated at all you know I just think that's going to be a, another super fight in my opinion yeah I think that's a fight they got to do in Vegas you know international fight week you know just stack the card have a couple title fights but just have you know the the unification featherweight championship on the line you know las vegas you know fight capital of the world neutral-ish territory um or i mean if volk wants to go he had his you know home ground advantage in australia mexico city you know that's <laughs> always an option you know i know it's high altitude so it kind of changes the a lot of the fights and like how the fights go but you know it's a huge they could do they could do a stadium show there you know, have yeah. you know, have Moreno fight. You know, have have uh, Volk- have Volkanovski and Rodriguez fight on the same card. You know, two Mexicans defending their titles, or well, one unifying and the other defending. But I think that'd yeah. be a, a banger of a Mexico City card. Do it at an arena. You know, sixty thousand seats, seventy thousand seats. Blow the roof off that place. Hell yeah! You said you've been to Dagestan. That's at altitude, right? Yeah, parts of it are. Uh, Mahachkalov, where we flew into, <coughs> where Khabib's from. There's there's like an there's like an ocean there. There's some there's some sea. But yeah, I didn't know that until we got there. I was like, I didn't know there's an ocean here. Oh, interesting. But there's an ocean. But those guys are generally training at altitude, yeah? Yeah, up in the mountains. Yeah, there's huge, huge mountains up there. Yeah, and so, like, Rodriguez is from Mexico City as well. That's at altitude, correct? He's from outside outside Mexico City. But, yeah, he's he's from crazy elevation town. Like, he's he's built for endurance. And that's what I just think that with some of these fighters that have been raised in altitude, I just think there's a real correlation between that and strength you know i mean is that a contributing factor to the the dagestani supreme wrestling game i think it's just the climate the wrestling just it's hard nose hard nose people up there it's cold it's not a not a happy place i can imagine dude so what's next for you? Like, what's the next? What's the next step from here? You're resting at the moment. <coughs> yeah, resting at the moment. Coming down from kind of all the chaos of travel, you know, multiple mm-hmm. continents. You know, that's three continents in the past. You know, couple months plus. I was in Japan right before that, so it just it's been crazy travel. So, I really got to sit down and like kind of plan out the next. I guess the next six months, just because those are gonna be really crazy. Yeah. Like crazy, crazy, you know, with Jamal trying to get back in the, back in the, I mean, he's trying to get back in the cage here soon. He's trying to fight Yuri. Depends how his rehab goes. I know, I mean, with Yair, I got Sergio coming up with a fight. Um, so I'd say the next seven months, I'm going to be working pretty much every single 
day starting mid March. I'd say I'm gonna be. Wow. I'll be on the road for the next six months, seven months. Wow. Yeah. Dude. So mentally preparing for that. When's that ultra marathon again? It's like November, isn't it? <coughs> September. The September coming up. There's one in May. So there's say. there's May's gonna be too soon just because I am not gonna be able to juggle doing these camps and then come back here and, you know, do do it the right way if I'm gonna go sub ten. Um so so yeah, I'm thinking September. So if I could really dial everything in over the next six months. In terms of clients and, and fights, I should have some free time to buy some land, start building that house, run the marathon by September, win Ooh. coach of the win trainer win trainer of the year by by July when yeah. the fan expo is going. So that's what the yes. next six months looks like in my head. Yes, uh, yes. So really, yeah. the house the house dream is this year. You think it's this year? It's going to get started. I hope so. I really do. Yeah. At least, I mean, dude, I could buy some land and live in a tent. Like, that's me That's me taking steps towards, like, I have the land, and then we're starting to build a foundation, you know? So, like, I'll sleep in a, I'll sleep in a storage shed. Like, I'm, I'm good to go. You know, I'm pretty, I'm pretty minimalist in terms of, like, what I need right now. But, so, that's, that's the way I see it. That's the way, it, that's what I'm working towards. So... Each, each opportunity I have is taking a step towards that. So got some cool projects in the works here as well that are going to, you know, build a good foundation for me here in the future. Um, so got a lot on my plate, but I may not look hungry, but well, no, I, I know I look hungry just because I was kidding, but, but, uh, <laughs> but I, I, I can eat, I can eat, so. I may not look like it, but I can eat. <laughs> I'm sure. I mean, you're six, four, you're six four. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure you're burning it. So yeah. you, you think you think you'd want to buy land in the Changu area? Yeah, no, not Changu. Um, I was going to say. I'm, I'm thinking more towards like Sese. Um, so that area or um, Kadungu Beach area is like my spot. So, love it up there yeah it's beautiful up there man and i think that's gonna be the next area that really this this area is too too popular it's just too many villas too many you know too many influencers that you know think there's somebody so yeah not my cup that, of tea you're an influencer no <laughs> i'm just kidding <laughs> i hope i hope not i, I want well, to influence people if no, i influence people to <laughs> Yeah, like you're, you're a trainer first, of it, I think, and I think there's people really standing up, and there'd be there'd be there'd be a lot of people wanting to aspire, you know, to what you're doing right now. I don't know how does that sit with you. Do you feel a sense of responsibility? I think the biggest thing that I can do is just be honest about the whole process of it. You know, it's not like obviously it looks a hell of a lot cooler than it is. You know, like it's it's a lot of struggle and it's a lot of it's a lot of sacrifice. You know, I sacrificed a lot of my youth for this, but it goes to show you that like this, there's like compound interest in in the work that you do now. You know, and the work that I've done and like what I've laid out for myself the past ten years. You know, sleeping on those floors in Thailand and being in a place where like it's basically free to not sleep on floors, but I was sleeping on floors. Like you could find a place in Thailand for ten bucks a night, yet that wasn't in the picture so it was like we were sleeping on floors and you know so going all in on on the big picture and the goal you know if i could help someone find what that is through my work you know and 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 letting them know you know i like i said it was it was one of those things where i struggled a lot in school i was turned out i was told i had a learning disability i was told that like i had to plan for other things um and really the only people that didn't think that were my parents you know, they truly believe that they had someone special, that had a special kid that, you know, had a bright future ahead of them. And, you know, so they, they nurtured me and, and believed in me and pushed me to do that. They supported me going to Thailand. You know, they they told me to go out there and, and try this and, and believe in this dream. And, you know, we don't all have supportive parents, but, like, if I could be that support for someone else, like, if anyone ever reaches out to me and asks, like, ways, you know, ways that they could be, in the position I'm in, I tell them everything I can, you know, because that's someone I didn't have. Um, 
And so I try to live that motto of being the person that I needed when I was a kid, you know, today. So if I can, if I can be that influence of over, you know, to whether it's a kid in high school that you know wants to be a be a nutritionist and a chef for you know fires or <coughs> someone that wants to start their own business um, and and build that from the ground up. I mean, yeah. any any way I can help that and you know help them you know manifest that into into reality is you know, a position that doesn't come with much pressure for me because I love to see people succeed and, and be able to, you know, achieve their dreams. Yeah. And you'll just share what you've learned on your journey. I like that. I feel that's what I'm here for. You know, I'm not, I, like I said, I'm not, I'm not here for, you know, leaving anything other than people forget, you know, how much money you make or whatever accolades you have, but it's the impact you have around the people, you know, that, that yeah. are around you. Yeah. And so it's like I'm not I'm not here to be known for the money I made in the sport or you know how many world titles I I helped win, but I'm here to you know have an impact on the culture of weight cutting, and I want to also have an impact on you know kids that are told that they can't be anything or aren't going to be anything, and you know help those kids help those kids just you know be like me, be in a position where they can change their lives and chase their dreams and you know help uplift their own communities and the kids around them and yeah I mean I can't tell you how many people have reached out to me and you know that I went to high school with that were like oh like it's so cool to see you doing your thing because like they saw the struggle of it right because I was like in all these classes and I'm like get sent to the counselor's office and like these counselors are you know looking me looking at me and like taking notes while I'm in class I'm like (laughs) <laughs> I feel like I'm being watched. Like, how do you guys expect me to learn when I could feel you watching me and I could hear you writing down your notes? Like, oh, he's he's yeah. distracted by. Of course, I'm distracted. I could feel you watching me. Like, and plus, this isn't interesting to me. Like, what do you want me to do? But <laughs> but it's one of those things where it's like taking a step back and you know, yeah. I I try to respond to everyone that reaches out to me and 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 tries to get help, whether it's with nutrition. I don't ask for you know. I'm not I'm not trying to. You know, getting money off anyone. I just want to help as many people as I can while you know while I'm here. Yeah, man, love it. I've got two last questions for you. I, the first one is, uh, just want to just on, on a real side note, we you just mentioned the culture of weight cutting. I know that it, there is discussion around you know how the damaging potentially it can be to athletes, especially when they have to do an aggressive weight cut. Yeah, you know what? What are your views on it, and and do you think it's necessary, or or how can it be done better? So I think in terms of it being done better is just getting more education. You know, like getting more information out there and educating athletes to, you know, proper ways of fueling, proper ways of dieting, proper ways of, you know, fueling each workout. Um, it all comes with education. You know, it's not something that's going to come naturally. You know, just because you're athletic doesn't mean you're going to know much about food or much about recovery or much about nutrition. You know, it's something that's not really taught. Um, and guys think that just like willpower alone will get you there. And it will a lot of the time, but long term, what are, what are we sacrificing in order to get there? You know? So like, let's say a guy, you know, goes into a fight dehydrated, more susceptible to a concussion, more susceptible to getting knocked out. That head trauma from that alone you know, can lead to a shorter career, you know, lapse of judgment in the fight, make mistakes, take unnecessary risks, you know, all the work that they've been doing in terms of skills is they're two steps behind because they're they're not firing properly, right? So it's one of those things where it's like you see a very talented young athlete go out there, get knocked out. It could change the entire trajectory of his career. It could change his brain chemistry. It could change every, the way his body functions in general. It's it's you it's it's a dangerous sport. So if you're going out there injured in terms of not being properly hydrated or being, you know, susceptible to more damage, you know, you're at risk. I think a reason why <coughs> a lot of guys, you know, cut weight is because coaches tell them Oh, you're in this weight class. Like, oh, you're you're this height. You're this weight class. So they have this idea that that's their weight class. When there's no, you know, science and there's no metrics behind it. It's just opinion. You know, it's just someone's opinion. Oh, you're 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 six one. You should be a welterweight. But based off their body composition, will their body allow them to do that? You know. So getting them around the right coaches, 
getting the right information out there and really building a mentality that's not about making weight but about performing because at the end of the day anyone could push themselves to make weight you know i could right now if i absolutely had to i could use all my brain matter and power to go and just mental fortitude to go out there and cut 15 pounds easily in terms of like it'd suck and it'd be horrible yeah but it's it takes no skill to do that you know, well, just it just takes sweating it, sweating it just out, and sweat just, it all out. It's all water. It's all water. It's nothing. It's nothing substantial. Like we're not losing body fat. We're not losing muscle. It's just water. Most of our bodies are made out of water. We can lose fifteen pounds. So it's like one of those things where it's like I'm not going to go out there and expect myself to perform at a high level. If I do that, get yeah. other guys do that and expect, you know, to go out there and perform. So it's one of those things. It's a cultural change. That's getting better, but still, a lot of coaches expect work the weight off, have a better relationship with food. <clears throat> but at the end of the day, if someone started cutting weight when they were a kid, their relationship with food is something that's going to be, you know, a lot of these guys have eating disorders just because they've been cutting weight for most of their lives. So it's like, it's easy to sit on the outside and be like, oh, stop eating so much at night when it's like they're literally they literally have an eating disorder based off of the decisions they made in order to make this weight so it's like it's one of those things that i try to push on my guys their relationship with food inside of camp outside of camp needs to be something that they're aware of and they take into you know take into consideration and being a year-round athlete as well you know obviously it's fun to go have some beers with the boys after the fights but after that you know, shift your focus back onto the, the, the task at hand, which is, you know, mm. being the best in the world, providing for your family, you know, staying within a reasonable weight of what you have to weigh in at, you know, not blowing up, you know, 35, 40 pounds between fights because then again, we're back in that same mentality of, okay, now, now it's fat camp. And that's obviously that's a blunt way to put it, but you're not working on skills when the camp is based off losing just weight. You know, if you if you need to lose forty pounds and the fight's in you know nine weeks, how much better are you going to be as an athlete by the end of those weeks? You know, those nine weeks are going to be built around you being in a severe calorie deficit and losing those forty pounds, not building that skill set. Because at the end of the day, it's not about losing weight; it's about going out there fighting and being the more skilled fighter. It's not the ultimate you know weight loss championship. So, <laughs> so stick, yeah, stick. I mean. <clears throat> just stick to your training, your program. Um, if you want to be, you know, if you want to be a world champion, if you want to be the best in the world, and you know, provide for your family, you got to make sacrifices. And with that comes, you know, dialing everything in. You can't be a normal person. At the end of the day, you know, you can't have a normal life. Like you can still enjoy the foods you like. You can still have, but it's got to be something that you track, dial in, and. Uh, and yeah, keep keep in mind that it's it's at the end of the day you always have to still make that weight if you're going to stay in that weight class. Gotcha. So I mean, when you watch when you see Paddy Pimblett who proudly puts on weight <coughs> post fight, you know, I mean, are you just sort of like sort of rolling your eyes when he does that? Like, what are your thoughts on Paddy Pimblett and the way he does it? I do because I know there's a lot of people that look up to him. You know, there's a lot of kids that think like, okay, like I want to be like Paddy. And, like, they see him, you know, gorging after fights, which, again, if you, like, if you talk to any, like, health professional and show them, you know, contrasting pictures of the before and after fight, all of them will say that that is a, a severe eating disorder or a starting of a severe eating disorder. So it's, like, they can make jokes about it and, like, and all that, but at the end of the day, he's going to have to pay... For those decisions just because he can't take short notice fights he will never be able to make weight if he takes a short notice fight he needs 10 weeks in order to make that weight and so his opportunity for you know taking those risks taking advantage of you know whatever it is situation if a big fight falls out you're on weight you're always you're always on track you know you're always in shape you're ready to go but let's say you need 10 12 weeks to make that weight you know, those opportunities fly by you. And I do feel like eventually your luck in the sport runs thinner and thinner. And 
his luck ran out when those judges gave him that decision against Jared Gordon. Jared Gordon is my guy, so I am slightly biased. But I have, I'm not obviously, I don't work with Patty Pimm, but I think he's great for the sport. But you can only be lucky for so long. And if you test your luck in the sport where, you know, any little thing can happen, I do feel like, you know, it, it's eventually going to come up and bite you. But yeah, he's playing, he's playing a dangerous game. And um, I hope he does have the right people around him that could help dial it in because it does look like, from the outside, it does look like a deeper issue. And it's not going to get better. He's getting older. You know, he's coming up to his, you know, his late 20s. It's not going to get any easier. So it's something that he has to really dial in if he wants to stay in the weight class and if he wants to be the best in the world. You know, if he wants to be, like, the gimmick and, you know, beat some of these guys along the way. But it's only tough fights from here. Jared's a tough guy. Jared's a very talented guy. And so since he technically beat him, you know, he's got to go up the ladder. And, I mean, a guy like Drew Dober, you know, is a dog, and that and Drew hits hard, and he's got a chin on him. And Drew's Drew tra- trains year round; he keeps keeps his weight in check year round. I mean, a guy like Michael Johnson as well trains year round, doesn't blow up. Those are guys that are just begging for that fight. And in the back of their minds, they're always ready to go. They they could take that fight on three weeks' notice and they'll jump on it, you know. And and Patty can't. Patty doesn't have that luxury because of you know the way he the way he you know, fluctuates his weight outside of camp. So I do hope he he can dial that in because that would be a, a lame excuse to why you didn't, you know, succeed in the sport or why you didn't get to where you want to go. Just because, you know, you want to have a couple burgers and some donuts, like that's that's just not, in my book, that's just a whack excuse to, you know, not not unleash the greatness that you say you have. It's just, it's it's too bad. But I hope he does dial it in because it, it it's... I I cringe each time I see it just because that's a big boy and he uh, he looks great on the scale though I mean he gets he he makes weight and he goes out there and he he performs but he lost um, that last fight so I'm I'm still I'm still a little bitter towards that he did. well he did Jared, Jared deserved that and he deserved the platform to you know share his story and <coughs> do his thing but it is what it is you can't change that. Yeah, no, it was a real contrast in potential role models, wasn't it? You know, so yeah, it's thanks for your perspective, and like it's really interesting and really good for people to hear. So, I'm guessing that's kind of the the philosophy that you would just give to just an average guy who likes to work out and and stay fit. For sure, that, I mean, what would you say to an average dude who's not in the UFC and? Just wants to stay fit and healthy. What would you say to them in regards to diet and exercise? I mean, if you're if you're working, like if you're training hard, you're balancing, you know, your your, your relationship with food, the exercise you're doing, you can still enjoy the foods you love, right? It's just a matter of moving your body. Like if you move your body more than you know the food you eat, you'll lose weight. You know, it's calories in, calories out. Pretty simple, like nuts and bolts type thing. But the idea that you have to, like, take away all the foods you like and, and you know, eat boiled, boiled, you know, chicken and spinach is not, is not it. You know, a lot of people think, oh, carbs make me fat. You know, carbs usually fuel most workouts you're going to be doing. So the idea of, like, and, like, fat making you fat. Like, fat's one of the best things you could be eating. Obviously, it comes high calories, but, you know, there's good fats. There's some bad fats, but at the end of the day, it's one of those things that if you have proper balance between like what you're eating, how you're training, and you're just in tune with how your body's recovering, at the end of the day, you know, you'll be in a good position to be successful in terms of like whether it's weight loss, weight gain, muscle gain, um, consistency, and kind of just dialing in whatever it is that you're trying to do. But the biggest thing that I try to tell people is like you're, you know your body best out of everyone. So like you feel like you're not recovering in between sessions, look back at what you did that day, write it down, go back and track it. On the days you feel incredible, track everything you did from the time you woke up, from the time you went to bed, how much water you drank. You can really pinpoint where you went wrong and what you did right. Like I can't sit here, I could write, I could write a plan down for someone that works phenomenally for Jamal Hill, but I could give it to you and you feel like shit. You know, it's one of those things that, like, it's not, there's no cookie cutter 
program for you know everyone. But at the end of the day, it's like you're, if you listen to your own biofeedback, track what you can. Obviously, you don't have to be obsessive about it, but that's the best way to kind of dial everything in. Because there's days where I wake up, I feel great, and I look back, I'm like, okay, this is what I did, this is what I did, and this is what I did. Let's try it tomorrow. Let's see like what we can do consistently to you know get more days like this. Um, and so I try to do that so I can really just dial everything in in terms of because yeah it's one of those things that's tough it's tough because there's a lot of information out there whether keto works whether you know it's paleo whatever it is like there's so much mixed information out there that it's tough to figure out what works for you but at the end of the day you're the best decider of like how your body responds to certain things so I mean some people do phenomenally off you know carnivore and you know am I going to stop someone from doing that if they you know if they're the average guy that you know works a nine to five and trains four times a week, and they lost you know forty pounds doing that. Probably not. If they feel phenomenally doing that, good for them. Is it what I'd recommend for a guy that's about to run you know a hundred mile marathon? Probably not. But at the end of the day, it's one of those things that if you are dialed in and like tuned into how your body responds to certain things, that's that's bar none the best way to kind of dial everything in for the future for you. Because obviously everyone's goals are different. Everyone's, you know, diff- everyone likes different foods. So it's tough to kind of like, you know, be like, oh, this is the best thing to do for everyone. Because, you know, there is not one best thing that's going to kind of like work for everyone, if that makes sense. Yes. Yeah, like a process of el- elimination and, and refining. And journaling worked really well for me years ago. And I kind of died sort of diagnosed myself as being gluten intolerant and and I yeah. did when I re- when I reduced gluten in my diet I felt much better way less brain fog and more energy and then I went the other way and I went no carbs and it was just like good fats and I must admit I shredded down it was the most shredded yeah. I'd ever been but then I was like I was just I needed carbs you know so again I think it's a journey and it's just whether people are disciplined and just willing to go on that journey and I guess it comes down to what their needs are so thanks for your your advice there it's, it's oh brilliant. of course of course yeah no worries and like you said like it's a process of, of uh, elimination but the biggest thing too like don't don't buy into one thing that you think is a secret sauce because at the end of the day there's a lot of money that goes into a lot of these diets and a lot of these fad diets where it's like there's good marketing behind it you know, a lot of these a lot of these influencers that say they're doing one thing, you know, are, are on a lot of supplements that, you know, you can't you can't get at your local supplement shop. So uh <laughs> uh, okay. Like they don't know it's in the vitamins. No one knows it's in the vitamins. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> like yeah, the liver king. The... You're talking about liver oh, king, yeah. remember? I mean, he, he, he's a great he, he's a great example of it. He's he is one of the examples, but yeah, for sure. Yeah. Down yeah, he was liver just King. eating liver, liver, yeah. and then he came out. <laughs> ah, it was a bit of a letdown, wasn't it, old Liver King? But did it surprise anybody? Did it really surprise you? Well, no, I you mean, be, I was impressed. I was impressed you by how jacked he was. Yeah, yeah you like, like to believe I, that that was that was a pro, that was like all he was doing. Oh, dude, I was like, because I'm an older guy. I'm like, I'm 46, and I'm like, I'm really like, wow, like. Maybe there's still hope for me, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, to yeah. have a body like that, you know. But man, what a pleasure talking to you! Like you've been on the back of my mind. I think I met you briefly at Indosol a couple yeah, of years you, ago, last year. Yeah, year you just got you just got done doing that interview with the dudes that do the uh, like they put it in the rivers and like it catches the 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 garbage the and stuff. The barriers, yeah. yeah. Soon I watch Gary and Sam Benjamin. Yeah. That's it. Yeah, that's it. And Kai, Kai Paul introduced <coughs> us. Yeah, I remember. But yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I, I've just sort of quietly been observing you from afar, and then especially like the last sort of year of watching fights, and then you know I'll be seeing you in like you know behind the scenes footage. You know, I was like, "There's that dude." I was like, "There's yeah. Ian, Chef Larios." You know, yes, and then obviously, I mean, and then obviously this year so far has just been a banger of a start to the year for, for <sighs> you and, and just 
the sport. It's been such an epic start. And I mean, and the fight's coming up. Oh my God, what a year it's going to be. So, yeah, it's going to be it's going to be busy. So yeah, that's why I'm trying. Like, it's important for me to come back here and just sit down and be like, all right. Like what? What do I? Where do I want to see myself in the next six months? Like who do I want to see myself as? Like if these, if I were to fast forward these next to, to these next six months, who do I want to be at those end of the six months? And like what? Yes, what? Sir. What do I want to be part of? So I gotta be a little bit more selective of, you know, who I work with and what what I put my energy into. But that's a great position to be in. You know, I've been I've been in the position of the opposite of like begging people for work. So. I, I'm I love, excited. You should be. But I love what you were saying about, you know, those early days of cold calling. I mean, that's such a hard thing to do. And, you know, it's like really humbling yourself and making those difficult phone calls or sending those, you know, those messages asking for a little foot in. I mean, these are the traits of successful people because they do those uncomfortable things that other people don't want to do, you know. And I'm yeah. sure there's people that could sit back and go, oh, look at you, look at the life you've got and look at, you know. But I don't really think they, re- they, they don't know that there was these times when you're sleeping with cockroaches on floors in Thailand and sending desperate emails to people for work, you know. That's amazing, bro. And it's made me who I am, but it makes me it makes me appreciate all the little moments of like I'm still that person, you know. I'm still I'm still that dude that, you know. We're all me like Gianni Suba was one of the kids that you know we we came up together, and he's got some huge opportunities in front of him now. He's you know commentating for one championship. He's got a huge project in the works here in Bali, Sick. Um, and we still we 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 still have that. Our, I think our group chat is called Swamp Boys, you know. Because yeah. we still, we're still that, you know, we're still, we still have that mentality of, you know, that we didn't have much, but we're willing to work for, for everything we have. And that, that mentality doesn't change. You know, we're still, we're still, in, we're still in the swamp. So, but dude, I think that's why, sorry, I know I, I'm sort of trying to wrap it up, but I like where the conversation is going, but I also think a lot of these fighters you're working with, you know, they, they've come from nothing. Like, I mean, Jamal Hill, you know, I'm, I'm yep. sure, yeah, yeah, Rodriguez didn't lead a charmed upbringing. I'm sure he did it tough coming from, you know, rural Mexico. And I heard Jamal Hill's got seven kids as well. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, man. He's got seven yeah. kids. <laughs> so yeah. maybe that's why, like, you know, you just, you're getting dr- these swamp rats that are succeeding. And, uh, you know, the swamp rats are coming together, dude. You better watch out for them, man. Those swamp rats, yeah, you got <laughs> those, those are the ones you got to look out for. They're coming. They're coming for. They're coming for gold. They're coming for all the gold. Yes, sir. <laughs> well, I'm cheering you on from afar, and thank you so much. You, some really, really it, nice. Man. You're always really sending me good, good energy, and I, I appreciate it. Every every message you send, and like every time you reach out, like it, it means a lot to me. And these are the people that I just want to try to, you know, be that example in their lives. You know, I've 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 put a lot into this, but like the biggest thing I can do is just leave leave an impact and like let other people know that like. Their biggest dreams and their biggest aspirations are, you know, just that. It's it's a doable thing. It's a feasible thing, and you know, I want to be an example of that. And so, the more good energy I have in my life, like people say, congrats to me. But there's a hell of a lot of people that you know believed in me and brought me up, and and that's those are the people that you know, regardless of all this whatever whatever you call it, success or yeah, you know, you know, it's 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 all for it's all. For, it's all for something, and I feel like it's it's yeah. it's yeah. it's coming. Are people reaching out? Are fighters reaching out to you now, like randomly? Are you getting more of that, or are you just still sticking with you, the the guys that you like to work with now, and that's it? For or sure, are you getting I've more a, opportunities. Ever since the Rogan the Rogan thing, I've had a, <laughs> a lot of uh, a lot of fighters reach out. Um, that's right. But I, to be honest, I try not to be to be too involved in my Instagram right now, just because it's 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 been a lot mentally to kind of wrap my head around all this and and yeah i just i'm gonna go out to gilly gilly air do some adventuring do some yeah. uh mind exploring and uh and yeah we'll uh we'll see what happens after that yeah dude i'm with you there man i love that yeah. well listen yeah. man i've actually i gotta get to my bjj class man i'm excited for that tonight yeah, so. man, go, go, go strangle some people 
Yeah, dude. Dude, I'm not good at strangling. I'm, my kimuras are coming along, but, dude, I get humbled. Just con- uh, just such a humbling activity to do. Jeez. It is. It, it, breaks oh, your, it, is, it is. You are the nail most of the time. Oh. <laughs> 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 all right, man. Hey, listen, I do ask really quickly, I ask all guests to come with a cause they want to support or advocate for. You've got the, what do you got for us? Bali Children's Foundation here in Bali. Bali. Church, who you ran the ultra marathon to raise money for. And yep. I will put a link to that organization in Ian's show notes. So scroll down, click on it, see how you can support that or donate. And um, yeah, you know, then another good cause, another, not, another opportunity to be of service and help people. So... All right. What it's all about. All right, man. Mr. Ian Chef Larios, everybody. Uh, you. Appreciate it, brother. Thank you so much for having me, man. <laughs> <laughs>